You know, the Lord, he filled our, he filled our, our hearts and our minds with understanding. He told us in his word what it is he's going to do and why he's going to do it. And then, <laughs> you know, if we allow the spirit of truth come talk to us a little while, he'll pull us out of the trap, out of the snare, out of the blindness of heart and mind, so that we can see that what Father is thinking is absolutely really what we truly want. Now, you can think that you can exalt men over you to rule over you because that's just the way it's going to be. You can't go find yourself an island and you be an independent person unto yourself. Somebody's going to rule over you, period. That's just, it's bad news, but that's the truth. And we got 6,000 years of human, recorded human history that shows that. Huh? So I want to talk to you here just a few minutes. I don't want to reason with you. So who do you want ruling over you? Jesus. And I just think about it. Just think about it. I just think. Think about it. Think about it. Who, who, who is it that you want rule? Come over to this side, baby. I'll give you this microphone. Who is it that you want ruling over you? Jesus. Just think about it. Just think about it. Just don't answer too quick. I'm afraid people act. I think afraid people just act, react too quickly. You need to consider this for a little while. Because I'm not so sure that every... Just stay with me over there. You've been around long enough. <laughs> Honestly, I, I just, I'm not sure that people are persuaded. I, I, think that, uh, I think that folks like the idea of putting themselves in charge and making themselves the king of the world. But it just ain't going to happen. <laughs> And then, and then I think we don't, we try not to think too pa far past the reality of, of what we live under every day in the world. Somebody says there's oppression. No kidding. People aren't being treated fair. <laughs> well, I'm glad you woke up. Nobody's, it ain't been ever happening, man. Nobody's been treated fair anywhere. Oppression goes on everywhere. And it just gets worse at every turn in the road. And we have these up and downs, you know, in human civilization. We have the moments of time where the oppression is, is the worst, where the full-blown tyranny of men come to express itself in, in the evil towards other men. And I'm telling you, there's no end to it. There is no end to it. You just... Most people today, I mean, God has given us and granted to us this privilege of, by and large, not even having really any kind of a real war, as it were, that had the impact of the last World War II that we had in World War II and the impact of World War I and the wars that preceded those wars. Those were incredibly intense wars. The Civil War, the Revolutionary War, both here in the United States of America, France, and other places in the earth. And, and it just goes on. I mean, it just keeps, you know, just it piles high to the, to, to the heavens. People haven't really, many people in this modern day have not really, they've been blessed to not have to really experience the, the, the intense evil and iniquity of what men can do to other men. Now, that. You can see that in third worlds. There's places you can go to right now. You can see the brutality, the evil of men's rule. If everything's allowed to go, as it were, to the wild type, okay, the wild state, you till up the ground, you know, for example, and, you know, you prepare it for seed to plant something good. If you just forget about it, it's going to go back to its wild state. It's not going to stay prepared and ready. Or you could till it up and you could have a great harvest out of it. And then if you leave it, it's just going to go right back to its wild state or wild type. The reality of it is, is God looked at the state of men and he said, it repents, I repent. I, I repent that I even made man because I had no idea that man was going to look like this, act like this, be like this. And that's the state of men because of the wickedness of men's heart. And... What we're going to see is we're going to see and watch as the world will continually move to its wild type, its wild state, its place where we've seen over and over again, we've seen 
the evil of men raise its ugly head. Nimrod, who was, who was one of the grandsons of Noah, the great-grandson of Noah, after Noah had come out of the great flood that had wiped off the face of the earth because the sin and the iniquity, God couldn't take it anymore. He said, there's no way. This is, I'm done with this. And Nimrod was, became a famous man in the earth because he hunted the souls of men. To rule over them was such tyranny, was this, such absolute dictatorship. And we've watched that happen over and over again. And we're going to watch the earth go to that and move to that. People don't realize that. They, they don't realize that the financial world is created that way. They don't realize that the governmental powers of the world, by and large, are subservient to the financial kingdom. He who has the golden rule in man's <laughs> eyes is he that has the gold rules. If you haven't discovered it yet, hello. Hello. There's somebody dictating what, how much you're gonna, what you're going to be able to do with your life and how much money you're going to make and what caste system you fall in. Somebody said, oh, I thought caste systems were only in India. You're living in one, believe me. I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter what your color of your skin is, what your nationality is, your background is. Come on. You just live in some caste system. And it's going to get worse. It's going to the, it's gonna go to ultimate tyranny, absolute tyranny once again. Well, I would just tell you this right now. Satan is actually... As the prince and the power of the air, he is the God of this world who now, with his manipulation and deception, works his evil through men. And he literally hunts the souls of men to destroy them with sin. He say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Well, you do whatever you want to do. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to learn, it's going to end in catastrophe. It's proof. I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, why do you let sin go on? Why don't you just stop the whole mess and end it? Why? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, first having revealed it out of his word, but having quickened it to me, that God allows sin to go on so that all men and angels and all creation for all time can see the ultimate conclusion of even just a little teeny bit of it. Just a little, the smallest little titer of it. Listen to me. It all ends in, in, in this total ruination where men say, we can do whatever we want. We hate you, God. We're going to fight against you. We're going to overthrow you. We're going to destroy you because you can't impose upon us your laws of life and your restrictions of that which is right because we bent on doing wrong. Eh? We bent on having our reveling and our parties. We're bent on doing it however we think we want to do it so that we can get for our own self the gain and that which we feel we deserve. Oh, God help us. The Lord's going to show it. And ultimately, that's why I say that the whole earth and all the world is moving to absolute tyranny that will ultimately arise up out of the anarchy and the state. You watch, watch as just a little, as a little microcosm of it. You look at what happened in the Middle East with Iraq. And you look at then the spread of the unrest and now with Syria and Iraq and, and the, the underground things that are happening in Iran right now because Iran's going to erupt. And what happens is you take away this ruthless rule of a dictator. And chaos emerges, anarchy emerges, until a greater dictator takes its place, his place. That's the way it works. Just someone who rules even more ruthlessly. And the Lord reveals to us that there is one coming that he's called everything opposite of Christ Jesus. And him men will love. To this one, men will ultimately turn. But he will take the devotions and affections of men and he will turn it around. And he will reign with such iniquity and reign with such evil and reign with such absolute power. You won't get to put a bite of bread in your mouth unless he says you can. So, who said that you'd like to have rule over you? Huh? United States government? You want to go to the UK? Huh? Where is it that you want to go? Switzerland? Who rabasiki yetelaba?
Eras de poyo. Kotai yana se peki ati satelai. Mombro se tara defi. Eras de paya la. Huh? Ayatollah. Would you like him to rule? Who would you like to rule? Take his suramata. How about Satan? Why don't we just go with him? He said, oh, I don't want Satan to rule over me. But people worship him always. They interact with him. They give, them, they give their power. They give their, their lives to him and say, rule over me. And he does so with iniquity that destroys people's lives on quantifiable, measurable scales. On qualitative scale, on, a, on both a qualitative and quantitative scale, he rules with such death and tyranny. And people are just deceived. They drink the Kool-Aid. They listen to the spin. Jesus Christ came for the sole purpose of breaking the strongholds over men so that the eyes of every person could be opened to recognize you don't have to live this life. You don't have to live under this tyranny. You don't have to live under this oppression. You don't have to live under this death. You don't have to live under this pain. You don't have to live under this torment. You don't have to live under this sorrow. You don't have to live under these things that will ultimately cause you despair and destruction of everything that is good. You'll lose, your, you'll lose your, your relationship with your own family, your parents, with your brothers and sisters. You'll lose your own relation, your relationship with the one that you fell in love with, your sweetheart that you thought you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. It ended in de- de- devastation and despair and, and divorce. He kills and destroys everything he touches. He kills and destroys it. Everywhere you let him in, there it's quantifiable. Listen to me. It's, it's both qualitative and quantitative. Anybody who steps, steps back and just takes a, a, a few moments of, uh, of rational thinking says, wait a minute here. There's something terribly evil and sinister going on around here. Jesus came to break off that yoke. He said, anybody who wants to be free, I'll set you free. See, Father's looking for people. He wants people who don't want to live under the sin of tyranny, the tyranny, the tyranny of sin, rather. People just think, well, oh, I'm going to be a Christian because, you know, after all, that's what my mom and my dad was and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, so I'm just going to be a Christian. Or, or they just get this idea that, oh, well, you know, might as well accept Jesus because he's our, he's our, he's our insurance that we're not going to die and go to hell. The Lord Jesus is seeking those who want to be liberated from a realm called darkness and sin. You listen to me now. Jesus didn't die at Calvary's cross to make you religious, to make you a Christian. He he came to seek and save those that were lost who want to be liberated from the prison, from the reign of darkness. He made a way so that you and I could escape. The, 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 the hell, the, the reign of evil, the spirit of disobedience, the lies, the destruction. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, there's one thing I cannot stand. How Satan wiggles his way in with his seducing spirits to destroy the innocent. He loves the innocent. He likes to eat the innocent for breakfast. That's his tasty delights. He likes to set people up so that they're led astray by somebody who doesn't really want to obey. You better watch yourself. Because Father is the avenger of all such. Listen to me. Father's going to be on the side of the innocent. He's going to be always on the side of the innocent. Father's going to always be on the side of the oppressed and the afflicted. To come and rescue them. That's what he is. He's going to minister to us in loving kindness and tender mercies. He's going to minister to us with equity and judgment. There's not going to be partiality in his judgment. There never has been. His rule is a rule of, 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 of love. You think about it. Can you imagine living in a kingdom where the, 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 the authority of, uh, that rules over men is love? That the Lord says, if you love me, you will obey me. And that's how the kingdom government works. It is a government of relationship. Wow. <laughs> you could see that in little tribal groups where it was like the chief, chieftain or the captain The person that was in charge was like the family father, the patriarch of the tribe. But still, you couldn't capture it there. Still couldn't capture it there. Because there was still self-gratification. And all he's doing is with his love and his mercy. With his meekness and his goodness. he, he, He created us in his image and his likeness. Somebody said, no, he didn't. I said, well, you prove it. You prove he didn't. Prove that he didn't. I'll prove that he did. 
God has no argument. He just says, there's foolish people. The fool said in their heart, there's no God. Huh? Oh, my, my, my. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can be seated. Just have a seat. I've got you standing here. Hallelujah. How are you doing, babe? Good morning, precious saints in light. We are in the last days and we are in the last phase. We're called to run this race with patience. And what do you do in the home stretch of any race? You put all you of in. your being, you kick it in, you start that sprint with everything that is within you. Mm -hmm. It's not how you begin the race, it's how you end the race. So everything that you can muster up is put in for the end of the race. So I have a focus at my finish line that everything in my life is centered around. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Thank you, Jesus. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord mm -hmm. forever and behold his beauty and inquire in his temple. Mm -hmm. So if I look at Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2, it tells me exactly how I qualify to dwell in the house forever. Mm. The psalmist asked the question, Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Mm -hmm. Who shall dwell in your holy hill? Mm -hmm. He that walketh uprightly. Mm -hmm. He that worketh righteousness. Mm -hmm. He that speaks the truth in his heart. Mm -hmm. The Lord is a sun and shield. Mm -hmm. He will give grace and glory. Mm. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk mm. uprightly. Mm. <laughs> Mm -mm -mm. The proverb says that the froward in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. Mm. But he that walketh uprightly is his delight. Oh, that you would study those things that the Lord abhors, that he hates, that are an abomination unto him. Versus those things that he delights in, that he is well pleased with. Mm hmm Take those things that he abhors and do just the opposite. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 9, 3, it says that they were not valiant for the truth in the earth. So you take all that is within you and you be valiant for the truth in the earth. They did not serve him with joy and gladness. So you be as the Holy Ghost is. He's the happiest person on earth. Yeah. And you serve him with joy and with gladness. If you look at the psalm, it says, but let all those that trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because they trust us in him, because he defends them. And let all, let all those that love his mm. name be joyful in thee. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, living God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter to Acts chapter 2. You know, I think that um, <laughs> everybody can view that the book of Acts is where the excitement begins. I mean, obviously, when you're reading the, You know, I, I've got in my Bible at home, I have this, in my Bible, I have this one page. And all it has is two words on it. And... and can anybody guess what that one page is? It's about in the middle of my Bible. That's correct. And uh, it's a new covenant. It's just one page, and it stands out really big. It just says new covenant. And um, up until that, there were, it's the old covenants. It's really not a singular covenant. There were many covenants from Genesis all the way up to the end of the way that our Bible is organized with Malachi. It's many covenants. You know, we can, we can list at least five covenants. And you know, there's arguable about whether there's more. But all of a sudden we hit a singular new covenant. It's a new interaction. Father has made a way so that we would ultimately be able to come back into what Adam stepped out of when he rebelled against God. Now, what happens is it's as though, it is though here is this doorway to be able to step into the glory of all that Father has 
purpose for us to be and to do. And as people start walking through the door to the doorway, there's a ditch. And folks fall in the ditch. And it seems like that maybe what even also happens is they walk into the doorway of stepping into this relationship of moving out of this earthly realm into a heavenly realm, out of an evil realm into the realms of the spirit, into the realms that belong to the living God. And immediately there's somebody at the door trying to get them to come back out, telling them, I've got something better. I got a better way. The preacher doesn't know what he's talking about or, you know, whatever. You know, the Bible doesn't re really say that. Here's what it really says. And then and that, that ultimately results in people falling back into a ditch of religion. And, all, and it's just boring. And it's just dull. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. And all, it's just really a bunch of ritual. I don't feel it. It ain't moving me. And yet all the time, there is the Word of God declaring to us this beautiful and exciting realm that we get to live in. I mean, people think about, they kind of glamorize Elijah. Wow, Elijah was an amazing guy. I mean, this guy, he, you know, he had this walk with God where it didn't matter who, what great king you were or what great power you were. He, he was still functioning in a realm that was greater. He was able to understand uh, what people were saying, what kings and rulers were saying in their secret council. He was that guy who ultimately was caught up um, by the Lord. Actually, the father sent a... a a chariot uh, from the realms of heaven to pick him up. It's just amazing. I mean, Father lo loves to be, I think in some respects, he loves to be very uh, uh, dramatic and, and uh, he, he likes to do things in, in a, a very profound way. I mean, because could he, he could have just, you know, easily just, you know, had uh, Elijah uh, come up into his presence the way Jesus sent it up. But instead he sent a fiery chariot to pick him up He's been living in the presence of the Lord now for about 2,600 and, and almost, you know, 70 years. 2,670 years. Been standing there in the presence of the Lord. I mean, there's all these different kinds of folks like that. Moses, who got to stand there and look at the presence of the Lord in a very unique way. <laughs> as he stood at Mount Sinai in Arabia. And uh, beheld the glory of the Father as the Lord appeared to him in a... In, in a cloud of, in a pillar of fire, a, a glory realm that is hard to even begin to conceptualize. I know I understand that Hollywood's trying to do a, another take on that one, but then they're still not going to get it right because it just still goes way beyond that. We see Jesus come and we see him ultimately have the heavens open before him and he begins to hear the audible voice of the Father and he, other people standing around him can hear the audible voice of the Father. The interaction with uh, the, the heavenly realm manifested on a scale to where that he uh, took the, 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 the water and turned it into wine. He raised the dead to life again. Things that people were eyewitnesses of. And it was once again an amazing, spectacular dimension of a whole nother way to live and to exist as he walks upon the water has authority to say to the wind and the waves be still tells devils who are possessing people making them mad and insane commanding them to live to leave and every devil has to obey he, ha he speaks to the physiology of a person b born without the proper organs uh, to be able to see and immediately they see he totally shows uh, uh, he reveals to us a whole nother physiology as it were power over the the realms of, of of how men are made whole and how men are healed when he says to the pair the, the paraplegic get up and walk around when he says to the deaf hear, when he says to the mute speak He's showing us a realm to live in. He's not, this isn't about a story. Elijah isn't, tell, it's not, Elijah isn't just telling a story. He's saying, he's waving to you right now. He's waving to you. He's waving to me. He's waving to us saying, hey, there's another realm to live in. Jesus, in all of those acts, is just waving to us saying, hey, there's another realm over here. When, when, when he was suddenly transfigured there on the mountain as he's praying and there, James and and. John and Peter are witness to, to this and suddenly he's transfigured before them. He's just right there in the natural, normal, earthly realm, praying, talking to the Father. And suddenly their eyes are open and they're able to see re the real power and effect of prayer. 
He's transfigured before them. And there stands Moses and Elijah and Almighty God the Father talking with him. And Father saying out of that realm, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him, you know. Peter talks about it some years later and says we were there in the mountain. He talks about it in 1 Peter. He says, we were there in the mountain. Chapter 1, I believe it starts about verse 18. We were there. We heard the audible voice. We saw the, we saw the glory. We saw it all take place as Jesus just stood there waving at us from another realm, waving to you and me right now from another realm, saying, you don't have to live where you're living. There's another place to live and there's far more going on than just your physical, natural realm. We, we see people, when they die, they lay down in, in a coffin and we see their body and then the body goes away and we, don't, we, we begin to, to deal with but don't really comprehend that all they did was step out of that body realm and transition into another realm that's called the unseen realm. People used to have more problems from a philosophical point of view with the unseen realm, but now, I mean, since there's a nuclear magnetic resonance and a whole bunch of other different uh, means by which we can now measure the unseen realm. The unseen realm shouldn't be that uh, aloof. It shouldn't be that far to, away from us in terms of conceptualizing an unseen realm, but it goes, it's even more unseen than that. It's a, to, it's a, it's a, it's, it's more than a parallel universe. It's more than another dimension. It is the dimension. It is life. It is, it is that place from which all other things exist. And, the, and what we see is Elijah waving to us over in that realm. Enoch was waving to us over there in that realm. Jesus is every miracle walking upon the waters, waving to us in that realm. When he has authority to command the winds of the wave, he's waving to us in that realm. When he's transfigured, he's waving to us from that realm. And we don't get it. We're stuck in this realm of thinking and, and having preferences and, 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 and uh, having issues that come to bear because... For many of God's people, they're really set upon their own personal interests. No matter how much they mature, they still can't get totally free from the pressure and the, and the effect of their own personal interests and their own personal demands and their own personal cravings because they want it their way. Oh, that's not what I believe. Or that's not what I want. And Father says, all of that is just nothing more than a, a, a prison for you to live in. <laughs> Come here, I want to show you how to live over in life. This is what the Lord's telling us in, in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is just, this is, these aren't stories. I mean, just a few stories that somebody tried to recollect about what Jesus did. These are the things that God fashioned and purposed ultimately to be laid out for us to understand about the life and ministry of Jesus so that we could walk in it and live in it. We would understand, here's how it works and here's what we need to do in order to participate with God in it. Your worst enemy is that which you actually seem to think. The deception is so terrible. Your worst enemy, what causes your pain, what causes death, what causes sorrow, what causes affliction, what causes everything that is on the inside of you that even drives some people to take their life it is sin. It's wrongdoing. And sin is far more. People say, oh, well, sin is missing the mark. Harmatia means missing mark. No, it doesn't. It's far worse than that. Sin is treason against the king of kings. It's tre treason against life. It's a violation against life itself. You're violating life. Men would in these last days of the word of God seek to even change the laws of nature. And so we're seeking to change the laws of nature. We're advancing the idea and the notion that homosexual marriage is equal to the marriage between a man and a woman. And of course, when I heard the folks over at Starbucks say, well, we believe, it, basically this was their statement, that if you think that um, homosexual marriage is, or they put it like this, if you think traditional marriage is, is uh, uh, somehow better than homosexual marriage, then we don't want your business. Uh, well, you know what? They never got, they haven't got my business since that day. If I was on an island and there was no place to drink anything and I had, all there was was a Starbucks, I'd die. 
because the bottom, bottom line of it is I'm having to say, okay, you're changing the laws of nature and you make a boisterous stand that says this. You make this boisterous stand that says, if God's laws, if you believe that God's laws is superior to the laws that we now prescribe, which clearly is just absolutely a lie. It's a deception. It's, 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 it's everything that goes against nature itself. Because nature itself is going to be having children and filling the earth and, and, and being blessed with the goodness of, of procreation. In fact, if you're a scientist and you want to define life, if it don't reproduce, it's not living. Now go back and read it again. Okay, because that's in your elementary science book. It just gets a little bit more detailed as you get into college. Come on now. Trying to change the laws of nature. It's not about philosophy. Hey, well, I, as far as I'm concerned, adultery is just as bad as homosexuality. As far as I'm concerned, lying is just as bad. As far as I'm concerned, every sin will ultimately lead to the same place. Because that's what God says. I just got wisdom and insight looking at what the Lord says. He said just a little bit of it will change that, make the whole thing terrible. Or make the whole thing bad. And you have to decide, how much do you want Satan ruling over you? You really need to get to know Satan. You ought to, just, you ought to study about the guy you're going to elect. Well, you don't even get to elect him. Huh? It's a default tyranny. Huh? People that are born under a, a, a tyrannical reign of a dictator, they didn't get to choose. They were born under it. Huh? If you were born under Stalin, Stalin is ruthless. One day he was telling his journals, let me show you how to control people. He grabbed a chicken, he put right there in front of him, live chicken. He plucked all the feathers off the chicken. As he's standing there talking to them, cussing them all out, telling them he's gonna kill them if they don't listen to what he's got to say. Huh? So he's plucking out the feathers. Set the chicken down, you know what the chicken did? Curled up to his boot. That's the mentality of men. That really happened. It's in the history books of Stalin's tyranny. Hmm? You ought to get to know Satan a little bit better. Because I'm telling you, all sin is serving him. See, I'm choosing. You're not choosing nothing. You would never choose to be unhappy. You would never choose to be poverty stricken. Huh? You would never choose to be tormented in the night. You would never choose heartache. You would never choose pain. Not anyone in their sane mind would choose such things. Sin is the choice of death. The greatest wisdom you could ever have is to come to realize that the wages of sin is death. The acts of it will result in your heartache, your sorrow. Men will abuse you. Why? Because their father, the devil, has control over their life. And all they are doing is emulating and reflecting those things which he demands of them. Because he is a dictator of the worst kind. And he's, he's a dictator that allows people <laughs> to believe that they're free of choice. What a dictator. What a deceiver. He gets all he wants. He gets all that he desires out of you, making you believe the whole time that it's your choice. You need to think about your choice a little bit better. Hmm. You need to think about it before you take that next bite of the plague. Huh? You need to think about it before you open up your veins to Ebola or whatever. <laughs> because I'm telling you right now, people, the plague of sin is death. The scripture says the wages of sin, the results, what you earn from sin is death. But, but what are you talking about, man? This is what everybody's doing. We're having a good time as we salvate our brain cells. We're having a great time as we mess with the very core of our central nervous system by by utilizing various different chemicals like crystal meth and the whole list goes on we actually subvert people subvert their souls with so many different things and soon some people subvert them so their souls with the drug called money and they'll do whatever it takes to get it. They'll oppress anybody they got to oppress. They'll trick anybody. And there's some smart people. When it comes to finances, there are some brilliant people who have devoted their life on how to get your money out of your pocket and into their pocket. And they do it not on one 
to ten, hundreds, thousands, but hundreds of thousands, hundreds of million scales. Come on, you listen to me. And you're just thinking, well, you know, it's all going, you're choosing all this stuff. You know? Majority of the stuff that goes on in your life has been dictated to you. Why don't you step back? Why don't you step back and take a little, just, just you know, just get yourself a diary out and start writing out. How much of this stuff did I choose to do? Do I really want to be doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I sitting in physical chemistry? <laughs> when only about a hand, handful of people even understand it. What am I going to do with this? What, what's behind, what's, what's, what's behind the, what's the logic? I'm going to make money. Hmm? I'm going to be famous. I'm going to win the Nobel Peace Prize or something. Or I'm going to, whatever. It's something that has to do with self-gratification, how you're going to get promoted into some kind of fame or fortune. But by and large, you ain't going to get it. You know how many musicians are out there trying to be a superstar? And how many superstars are there? You're not going to get it. It's a trick. It's a rainbow. It's got a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. And all these ideas and all these notions that run through people's mind that ultimately be, is the motive for why they spend their life for what, that, what, what cannot profit them. If you're investing in this earth, I'm going to tell you right now, it is a bankrupt investment because it will dissolve with a fervent heat. Father's going to destroy it. And I'm very happy. He's going to burn up its works. He's going to create a new heaven and earth wherein dwells only righteousness. And the people that are going to be there are going to be adamant. I'm not having any of that iniquity and sin in my life. If you look at God's cherubims, the ones that he set there that you read about in Genesis to keep the tree of life. When God kicked man out of the paradise, out of that heavenly realm. He said, no, he sent him out. And he put there the cherub, which means the protector. He stands about 40 foot tall. He's a ferocious looking guy. He's got a, he's got a wild look to him. You don't know which eye to look at or which face to look at. He's got a face of a man, a face of an ox, a face of a lion, a face of an eagle. Anyone's going to be looking really tough. <laughs> he's, got, he's got four arms. And in each arm, he has a flaming fire, a, a, a sword that is a, a, literally a flame of fire. He, his spirit is in a wheel inside of a wheel full of eyes. And wherever the wheel goes, he goes. And he's standing there. You stand away from the holy things of God. Get back. You're not coming near him or his stuff. You stay in that darkness that you've chosen. Jesus made a way for you and I to be welcomed past the cherub. To be welcomed in the presence of the seraphim who cover their faces and cry, holy, holy, holy. You're not messing with Father. You're not messing with his holiness. You're not messing with his purity. You're not bringing all your wickedness and your evil and your iniquity in here. Satan believes that he can actually raise an army even after the cross of Calvary. Somebody said, I thought Satan was defeated at Calvary. He was. He was defeated when Jesus Christ died. But he's a rebel. He's a, he's a pathological liar. He doesn't believe it. He's going to raise an army to ultimately try to overthrow God, to come out and fight against God. An alien invader. Yeah. Trying to impose his will on us. And say we can't have adultery. And say we can't have fornication. And say we can't have murder. And say we can't have homosexuality. And say we can't get drunk. And say we can't do drugs. And abuse ourselves. And abuse the souls and bodies of men around us. We're not allowing him in. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 12, it says that Satan is cast out of heaven. He leaves, comes out of the unseen realm where he right now is spiritual wickedness in high places. He comes out of the unseen realm, and now he becomes visible and physical for men to interact with. I'm telling you, people, there's more interaction. There's more. You're giving more service to Satan and allowing him to rule far more than you really want to. And only the Word of God can open your eyes. Only the truth, knowing the truth, can you be free. To know the truth, not to just 
know about the truth, but to know, to have intimate knowledge of the truth. There's a big difference between knowledge and understanding and wisdom, the wisdom of the, in, the insight of knowledge, the wisdom, huh? the understanding of knowledge, the ability to take what you know and do something with it and apply it. Huh? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's come to give to us this insight, to give to us this revelation, to give to us this understanding that we may know the truth and by the truth be set free from all the influences of Satan. Did Christ Jesus come and liberate us and set us free? Yes, he did. But you can easily, by the voluntary will of your own notions, uh, oh, come and obey Satan again and become into bondage again. He, during the days of the Apostle Paul, came into bondage through such, sim through such seemingly harmless agreements. I think that one of the most important pages in people's Bible is to recognize where the transition takes place from the old covenants to the new covenant. A new testament, a new covenant. And this isn't, this isn't a means by which God mitigates your iniquity. This is the means by which the Lord liberates us, giving us a new heart and a new spirit and says, you got to be made all over again. I want to wash you not just on the level of a ritual cleansing. I want to wash you by the water of regeneration. I mean, I want to regenerate you. I want to change every cell, as it were, in your body. The genomic sequence of every cell in your body is going to be made completely different. The washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul called salvation in Titus 3, 5, and 6. If there's anything God's people got to get a hold of it, it's that. And then on top of that, the Father sent the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us into all truth. So that we would be filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and live by the Spirit. And people say they do, but they don't. And that's a choice that you and I are going to ultimately make it various different levels and degrees of consciousness where we choose to do it our way when the word of God is saying the word of God is saying come over here walk right this way make the turn right there and come in right over here and there stands Christ Jesus there stands the apostle Paul there stands everybody who ever stepped over in this realm waving at us saying Come on in, guys. It's really much better living over here. It's really a far better realm. This is the place now that you have all authority. This is the place of sonship. As many as would receive, he gave them the authority to be sons. This is the place where we have the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. This is the place where we cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, and they recover. This is the place where we command the dead to raise to life again. And all the problem, all the while, the problem is God's people never realize that. I have more tolerance to be very honest in every tr and transparent and more tolerance for the folks that don't believe it's for today than I do for the people who believe it's for the day but aren't willing to obey what you have to obey in order to have it and do it. You think about it. They think that but what they know, that their orthodoxy somehow promotes them into a special category. It actually, it doesn't. Because if you don't do it, it actually demotes you. Because now, having known it and know the, knowing the truth, and now being given the responsibility, you have a greater accountability to the Lord. And a greater condemnation for not obeying the truth. Huh? Uh, Father, did it, did it, Jesus didn't die at Calvary's cross. Father, did it send Jesus to bow our sins in his own body to go down, to die and go down into hell so we can continue to live the human existence in the human condition that we lived in before we came to know him by the miracle of deliverance. People say salvation. No, the word means deliverance. People, have, people are lost in the, uh, in the, in the, in the misguided <laughs> connotations and denotations of words and semantics uh, that, that men have misapplied words and given new context to. Jesus came to deliver us. When, when, when Zechariah saw the deliverance, he goes, Praise God! 
Now we're delivered, going being delivered out of the hand of our enemy. We can walk with God in righteousness and holiness all the days of our life. To most modern people, that sounds like not fun, not liberation, but some kind of bondage. What do you mean? I thought we were going to, he's getting ready to say we're going to get ready to have something fun to do. Praise God. Now that Jesus has come, we can continue in sin and it's not going to be held against us. Woo! Because that's really the reaction. Let me give that to you. But you got a wrong heart if that's the response. Because wisdom will show you that the way to sin is death. That when you open the door to wrongdoing, Huh? David walked with God in a wonderful and a beautiful way, and God promoted him in such an amazing way in his kingdom. But one day, he opened the door to wrongdoing with Bathsheba. It cost him two sons' lives. Two boys were killed out of it. A daughter who went completely wacko because her brother raped her. You can see David's life is totally protected. He opens the door to sin and destruction, death and destruction, sits down in his house. God's telling you something. He's saying it over and again, the wages of sin is death. The Lord's not going to go into big explanation. He wants our heart. Father isn't interested in our knowledge. He wants our affections, our emotions, our love. He's, he's interested in the kisses. Huh? Simon and the rest of the Pharisees that invited Jesus over, they, I know what they wanted to do. They wanted to impress Jesus with their knowledge of the word. They were the Pharisee. They were the, they were the Haradim. The tremblers, those who knew the word and knew God and so broken and contrite where the Lord dwells. And they wanted to evaluate him with all of their insights and all their knowledge. Jesus wouldn't be evaluated. He didn't play. He didn't get to that place. Because he knows sinner gets in there and here comes a woman who is a sinner. Huh? And, I, and it would be just right if she was the worst kind of sinner. It would be just a, because that's the way the Lord, he's, he's, she, she was the worst kind of sinner looking to get a, have a new life. She wasn't the worst kind of sinner looking to have a justification of how she could still be right with God and continue on her sin. She wanted to deliver it out of the mess that she was oppressed in. She was relegated to be man's whore. And it's the same way it goes on in the Middle East today. There's certain people. It's a caste system. There's no way out of it. True. And I could go into stories about that that I know firsthand. I went into a place that you're not allowed to go to in the Middle East, in Mbaba, because the Lord told me to go and administer to a group of over 300 girls who were uh, cast into a system of prostitution by the Islamic state that they lived in. Go minister to them so that they could receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Uh, I went into the most fundamental radical Islamic place in the Middle East and watched the power of God shake some, shake some women. And I just received a report the other day that there is now five, over 5,000 of them. Yeah. Holy Ghost filled women. Yeah. Hallelujah. There's over 5,000 of them. Uh, huh? She comes in. She interrupts the whole thing. She falls down at his feet. She, 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 uh, she does things that everybody else would be appalled at with coming to the meeting in their, in their suits and ties and, and all of, you know, their pomp and circumstance. She begins to sob at his feet, washing them with her tears, drying them with her hair, kissing him repeatedly as she lays there at his feet. And they're just, all they can say is, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman she is. He knew exactly who she was. And she was being liberated from her sin right there because she wanted liberation. She wanted to be delivered. The question is, do you want to be liberated? Do you want to be delivered? Or do you want to live under the, you want to live under the harassment and the torment of sin and death? Jesus died to save sinners, to deliver sinners. To liberate them. To liberate them from their sin. Because sin is actually a function and activity of a demonic realm imposing itself upon you. With its deception and with its lies and with the force of its lust. That's it. 
there is a place to be totally liberated from that and live the way that God created us when he created man in his own image and his likeness. Hallelujah. And then formed from man, took, took from man blood, a bone. And from that blood that he created, man with formed the woman and brought them together to live in a relationship of, of love and intimacy to grow as it were in the confinements of a terrestrial realm in an earthly realm to come to full revelation about the beauty and the splendor of what it means to have relationship that is unending that lasts forever I mean you don't want any good thing to come to an end no you do not the only thing the only re listen when when you fall in love I, I've I, I, I fell in love. I'm completely immersed, fell in love, filled with love. My wife and I are coming up on 30 years of being married. And we in love. And you think I want this to end? There's no way I want this to end. I mean, there is absolutely no way in any scenario that you could create that I would agree to this ending. Good things you don't want to end. That's the way Father is. He didn't create anybody. He didn't, Father didn't create this, all this beauty of his splendor and all this beauty of his life to have an ending. There is no ending. He's exalted his law and his word above his own name. He said, oh, when I go into the grave, I die and I am forgotten and remembered no more. Yeah, if you die in your sins, you are forgotten by God and remembered no more by him. Psalms 88 makes that clear. But that doesn't mean that you, your existence in, because God makes it very clear that all the dead who died in their sin and iniquity shall be raised up from the grave to stand at a judgment seat called the white throne judgment where God stands there holding men accountable for the gift of life that he gave them and allowing them to understand that they chose the rulership and the tyranny of darkness. They said that's where they want to stay and that's where they want to live by their own choices. They rejected the gospel. The Lord Jesus made it very clear. He said, go preach the gospel. Go preach the good news. They that believe shall be delivered. They that do reject it shall be damned. And he leaves it right there. Father's not forcing anybody. It's not just some people are born to know God and everybody else is born to go to hell. It's not, Father isn't that way. Anyone who would say that doesn't know anything about the nature of Father. He's full of loving kindness and tender mercy. He's not willing that any would perish. The grace of God has appeared to all men. God's grace has appeared in teaching everybody sin will destroy you. Teaching us to deny ungodliness. Do not allow it in. Listen, God, listen, knowing that God is coming, he judges every man. He has no respecter of persons. Everyone's going to give an account for the life because it, it might your life might not be sacred and holy to you, but it's sacred and holy to him. Your life might not be precious to you, but it's precious to him. And the only reason it's not sacred and holy to you is because you've been deceived and you've been lied to and you believe the whole story. Right now, the spirit of truth is here. God's crying out. He's crying out to, to sinner and saint alike. Saying, how long will you pervert your ways? How long will you continue doing it your way? When is it you, you'll lay hold on trusting Father? Father just wants us to trust him. It's just at the very beginning. He looked at Adam and he said, just trust me. He said, look, I give you everything. It's all yours. Don't mess with the knowledge of good and evil. Do not mess with it. It's mine. It belongs to me. He didn't shut men out of a choice. He left them in with the choice. He didn't, he didn't tell you to go through a long story saying this is what's going to happen if you choose wrong. Just walk with me. Just come into a relationship with me. Let me just tell you right now. Listen, can I make life simple for you? You know what the most important thing is to you? Relationships. Nothing more important to you. You can be deceived for, for a little while. I believe it's money. You may be deceived for a little while and believe it's fame. But when it's all said and done, all that is important to you are the lasting relationships. What grieves you the most is the relationships that fell apart. The deep hurts of it. Father's, father 
has brought us into a relationship with himself that is so wonderful and so beautiful. And if we'll interact with him, he'll teach us how to do relationships properly. And they'll last as they're supposed to. And you'll have your, your mom and dad will stay together and love each other. And the children will be gathered around them and love to be in the house, not saying, oh, I can't wait till I turn 18 so I can get out here. Huh? That's totally dysfunctional in every way. He gather all, you gather your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, as long as the Lord gives you life on this earth and you want them around you. Amen. Huh? Because there's something right about you. You do anything, you'll, you'll do whatever it takes to see those relationships and to see those lives preserved. Because there's something there that is so unexplainable and so undefinable and so deep and so powerful and so motivating. And it's called love. It's called real love. It's true love. It's the love of mom for the baby. Baby for the mom. <laughs> it's hard to even put it in the context of husband for wife now that the statistics of divorce is so high. Because the lust of the flesh so imposes itself upon people. And it's not just the lust of the flesh. It's also... The lust of the eye because so many people's marriages are broken up because they've all got to pursue their own career and their own interest. To what? To what? For what goal? To what end? For what purpose? What's that going to do for you after you've worn yourself out and you're 67 years old and you look ugly by any measure, including your own? And now you're going to retire with what? What you poured out your whole life to have. So you are going to cuddle up to your money. You're going to get your checkbook out, and you're going to get your ledger out, and you're going to get your stocks out. And you're going to sit there and, and just interact with them. <laughs> or you poured your whole life into having these, these. And they can't talk back to you. And they can't give affection back to you. And so you're sitting there, heartache, heartbroken, full of heartache. And now you become bitter. Because suddenly you begin to deal deeply in your subconscious that you have been tricked and lied to and you fell for it. And now you got nothing. Dear people, the Lord Jesus Christ came for the sole purpose of delivering us from darkness. Another synonym for that is ignorance. Another synonym for that is the realms of the demonic, the place where Satan reigns. Another synonym for that is the realm of disobedience. You're disobeying the laws of life. Huh? Can you imagine what it would be like if there was no speed, if there was no, if there was, it was, there was no speed limit? Can you imagine what it would be like if there was a speed limit but there was no police to enforce the speed limit? If there was no rules on the road? Go to Nepal. You don't think there's any rules. <laughs> Cairo at midnight. You don't think there's any rules. I would not drive there. You don't know how they're doing that. And the horn's going off all night. All, the rule is blow your horn very, very loud so that everybody gets out of your way. And you kind of got a flow of traffic going this way. And you kind of got a flow of traffic going the opposite direction. But that kind of gets messed up. God's got laws to life. There's rules everywhere. If you're going to succeed in any dimension of your life, you're going to obey the rules. Go plant seed in the wintertime. You'd be an idiot. Because it don't work that way. There's rules. There's rules to life. Huh? Decide that you're going to get out there and till the ground and plant the seed in July. Once again. I mean, what's really funny to me is people start talking about, oh, no, they can see the you know, crisis coming. And they're looking, their, their eye in their backyard saying, yeah, well, we can put a garden back there. Man, you will die before anything grows there. You know nothing about it. And even if it did grow, you would be so, you would look like you had been living in a concentration camp, living off those couple of tomatoes and a couple of head of lettuce. And give me a break. You'll be, you'll, be, you'll be hunting, you, there won't even be squirrels left. 
you'd be hunting gophers for a different reason. The mice population and gopher population will fast erode. Because then people aren't going to be able to grow nothing. And then how they can, they don't know. It's going to take a long time to learn how to even trap those boys. There's laws, there's rules. And the most important laws and the most important rules is what goes on in your spirit, what goes on in your thinking, what goes on in your choices, what you choose. I'm interested in people making real, genuine choices to say, okay, okay, I, I, I'm done with this nonsense. I'm not interested in having a statistics about how many people came to the altar call. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested about how many people surrendered their life to God, got some insight, got some wisdom that the kind of life that they've been living is a life that is run by demon spirits, and it's anti-God, and it's anti-Christ. So I said, oh, if I could see God, then I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. It's been proven over and again. And besides that, people will live with God for 1,000 years. At the end of this age, people will live with God for 1,000 years. And then at the end of that 1,000 years, the Scripture says, Satan will be loose for a little season. And literally, people will flock to the presence of Satan because they've never wanted to live under the rules of God. They'll go. They'll, God will make an opportunity or a place for everybody who wants to run to iniquity and run to sin. And they'll run there after living with God for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. The scripture says they will, there will be so many, it would be like to try to number them would be comparable to numbering the sand upon the seashore. And just think about it. You've got nobody dying for 1,000 years. Okay, just do the math. You've got nobody dying for 1,000 years. And let's say by nine, let's just say by 2050, there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet. Okay, let's just say that even, let's just say that even 25% of those made it through the great tribulation, which is a great catastrophe that you can see measurably right now, things building towards that on every level, not only, in, not only governmental level, but also an environmental level, not on a social level, okay, but economic level on every scale. So you got 25% of that, or just even say 10% of the people go, from, go into that uh, place where they get to be a part of that 1,000 years of reign, as, not as the resurrected saints, but just as normal human beings that God created in His image and His likeness when He made Adam and Eve. Huh? So you got, you know, you got 900 million go in at a 10%. And now 1,000 years, eh? Talk about being on the end of the hockey stick. 1,000 years after 1,000 years. What's, nobody's dying, everybody's living? That's a lot of folks. And it sounds like the majority of them is going to run to the realms of Satan because they didn't like God's rule. Because Jesus is going to come rule with a rod of iron. You didn't like the preacher? You didn't like the tough preacher? You didn't like the passionate Preacher, some people said, ah, George Whitfield, he's so passionate, he's so intense, we don't know whether he's happy or angry. One day, uh, you know, that's the religious people's opinion of George Whitfield, rather. One day, a, a famous Scottish philosopher, Dave Holm, was going to see George Whitfield, and someone said to him, I, I, didn't, I didn't think you believed in God and the gospel. He said, I don't, but he does. He wanted to come see somebody who was passionate about what they believed in. There was a reality there in his life. Huh? Dear people, I'm going to say this to you. You get to choose whether or not you want to come under God's government. It's a strict rule. Knowing the, terror of men, knowing the terror of God, we thus persuade men. If you don't think the government of God is a strict rule, somebody's lied to you. You need to read the book. I tell people all the time, it's one thing that I say over and again. In these last days, with this much deception, with this much heresy, with these many lies going down, you need to just read the Bible. Just read it. You can spend an hour a day, less than an hour a day, and you can get to the Bible every 90 days, four times a year. I guarantee you after the first year, your life is going to be changed. 
because suddenly you're going to be able to hear, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Because you're all of a sudden, you begin to become, by the miracle of God's love and grace, you become, begin to become familiar with the way God talks, the way he thinks, what he says. And then you start hearing people espousing all these things. You go, wait a minute, that's not even, that's not even Bible. That's not the way God talks. But you know what? All these people are so expert on God, and they've never even really read through the Bible. Huh? And somebody said, well, I read through it once. Why are you? You know, 100% recall? You just sit there and look at it, read it again, and you remember everything? Even if you did have 100% recall and you me remembered everything, that ain't going to make the difference of meditating on the Word of God because it's the Holy Spirit who comes and re retains all right to revelation and calls us through the meditation of the Word to suddenly behold wondrous things out of His Word. Hello. It's time people get real. Who do you want reigning over you? I just want you to think about it. He's a strict rule. He's a strict rule. His eyes are a flame of fire. Okay. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Somebody said, you got a sword in your mouth. Well, I said, said, praise God. Thank you. They thought they was criticizing me. I was being blessed. <laughs> sharp two-edged sword. The word of God. Hallelujah. I'm not waiting to be a part of his rulership. I'm in his rulership right now. I'm going to tell people where they're right and where they're wrong. And you know, you want to see, you want to see a riot get started real quick? Start telling people they're wrong. Start just telling people they can't do that. Whoa. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, a riot will turn into anarchy quickly. And the atmosphere is charged with it. Why? Because we ultimately, as, as a culture, came to the place where we, we thought we had, really, we had really graduated into a place of such astute knowledge and understanding when we just said, we're going to question authority. Oh, high five. Our professors at school back in the early 80s were... Oh, now we're in the time you guys are living in a great time period in the history of our nation because now you're stepping up to question authority. Good for you. Then we transition from questioning authority to despising authority, and that's where we've been living, despising authority. You can see it everywhere. It's miserable. Despising Congress. Ah, oh, that bunch of... Ah, ah. Well, so are you. What would you be doing if you were there? House of Representatives, rah, President, rah, all governmental authority and power. The police, rah. Huh? let's see what you're going to do when, you, when your life is threatened every day. I mean, go on and on and on. Now, we've now transitioned from de despising authority because it has a, it has a stepwise conclusion to defying authority, which is anarchy. And behold, you're living in those days. Hope you're having fun. Hope you're ready for the consequences of your choice because it's pretty ugly. Just read the history book. It's happened again and again and again and again. No surprises here. No surprises. The inevitable choices of men, they continue to repeat themselves over and over again. There's only one place of safety. To come under Father's rule. I tell you, there's a place to live in the heavenly realm where a thousand will fall by your side and ten thousand by your right hand will not come nigh you. I live in a heavenly realm. I don't get sick. I live in a place called divine health. I live in a heavenly realm where I don't have to make up my own mind and work through my own with my own knowledge. I live in a place called the mind of Christ where the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and talks to me, where He leads me and where He guides me. Huh? If, the, if I, it, you know, the, 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 the flame cannot kindle upon me. Somebody said, oh, what if there's a nuclear war? Hey, there's a very big, big possibility there could be. You know, people don't realize how the various different governments that hate us patrol our shores with their nuclear subs. So let it blow. I'm going to be fine. Flame can't kindle upon me. And if it does, I'm fine with you because I'm just going to transition from this body over into a realm that I already live in. I mean, who's, gonna, who's, gonna, who's going to honestly... Reject peace every day when you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night. And no bad dreams. And joy, rather good dreams, heavenly dreams. And joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. A realm of living where it's not a command. Oh, the Lord says we got to rejoice forevermore. <laughs> Just get, I'm worn out. I'm worn out. I can't take it. 
Rejoicing evermore. Uh, come on. Why do you expect this? No, it's a realm in which you live. It's a declaration. It's this is who you are. It's a testimony. It's a witness that you've been born from above. You've been born again. You've been born of the Spirit. you filled with the glory of heaven. Uh, who's going to read in their right mind? Who would reject joy unspeakable, joy unending? Uh, the empowerment to rejoice forevermore. <laughs> Nobody. You have to be deceived, bad. To say, I don't want that. I don't believe in it. <laughs> you don't believe in it. <laughs> yeah, you do. You want it. That's why everything you're doing is working towards that ultimate goal. But you're going on the wrong road. You're not moving according to knowledge and understanding and wisdom. You're doing it after the fashion in which a, a lie has been dictated to you. It's time to wake up. The light's shining. <laughs> if I didn't get out of bed by 7 in the morning, my grandmother would come in and say, What's wrong? Are you sick? Day's half gone. She's been up since 4.30. What's, are you sick? No, I'm just trying to get some rest. <laughs> Are you sick? You sleeping? It's one in the afternoon. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. The light's shining. The day is far spent. The time of our redemption is very near. The time of the coming of the Lord Jesus is very near. Men are deciding whose side they're on. And if you don't believe that you're deciding whose side you're on, I'm telling you, every day, in every dimension of your life, you are deciding whose side you're on. In every various different dimension of your life, socially, politically, economically, you're deciding personally, relationally, culturally, You're deciding whose side you're on. But bigger than that, you're deciding who's, who will be your God. Because I tell you, there is no question about it. As much as life dictates to us in every dimension, in every place that you see it, there will be government. There will be someone in charge. There will be rulership. No matter where you go, you will not find the absence of it. And it only reflects the reality of something that's going on even a higher dominion of life. There is the God of this world. He is the spirit of disobedience. That spirit of disobedience is directed at simply not willing to obey God's word. That's disobedience. That's how you define disobedience. And then there's the God, the God, the only true and living God who created heaven and earth. Who sent his only begotten son. God. Who was manifested in the flesh. Christ Je And called by name Christ Jesus. Or the savior. The deliverer. The Messiah. Who is called literally. If you want to just get rid of names. The deliverer. And ruler. Hallelujah. The deliverer. And ruler. And he's going to. And Father, I'm going to tell you right now. Father has exalted him at his own right hand, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named in this world and in the world to come, and he shall rule and reign forever. It's already done. Your, your decision, and your, my decision, ain't even in the equation. It's already done. When in Numbers chapter 14, when people were rebelling against God, and God was visibly being made manifest to Israel, and they rejected God, Father said, they, they don't have a heart to serve me. They don't have a heart to know me. But I'm going to tell you this one. I, I'll tell you this. Surely as I live, says the Lord. This is what he said. Surely as I live, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. It's already done deal. It's already done deal. And the Holy Spirit is here to sober you up. The people that are here that are going to have the hardest time sobering up are you folks that are religious and were raised in churches. You're, going to be, you're the hardest to reach group. Because you think that you know. Satan, Lucifer, was raised in church. And he became so high on his own intellect and knowledge and insight. 
He was raised in church. Raised in the best church that ever existed. Father was the pastor. The holies of holies, the true holies of holies in heaven was the sanctuary. The easiest people to reach are the lost who've never known any different. All they've done is a life of pain and sin and iniquity. And I'm telling you right now, I was telling some men of God not too long ago, and, and they all bore witness that it's true. I see where the Lord has withheld the harvest because they're going to come in here if you, you start reaching the lost who really want change, and then people in here that know the Lord, supposedly know the Lord, and then they begin to lead them astray, my goodness, hell is hot for you, number one. And number two, Father doesn't want his harvest spoiled. Huh? People need to be like the, 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 the atheist philosopher, Dave Hum, and at least say, well, I don't believe, but they do, and I just want to go to watch their belief at work. Dear people, I'm going to tell you right now, God isn't going to bring a harvest into a place where it's going to get spoiled. It's time God's people decide whose side they're on. And I believe with all of my heart that Father's doing a work, sovereign work right now to make that happen. Yes. That people are going to get sorted out. Amen. People are going to get sorted out. They're going to get sorted out. People who don't really want to walk with the Lord that are just sitting in the place ready just to spoil the harvest. Ready to lead someone astray. Because you're so rooted in disobedience, so rooted in your own way. You listen to me. Father's changed the landscape of it all. Father's full of loving kindness and tender mercy. He's got enough for everybody. No matter how many times you transgress, if you're willing to obey, if you're willing to learn, he'll forgive you. But his rules are strict and absolute and non-compromisable. Compromise is demonic. He has no compromise at all, period, none, zero. He calls us to come and agree with him. That's it. Agreement is a vast agreement. It's the opposite of compromise. Huh? Somebody says, no, it's the middle of the road. No, it's the opposite. As light is from darkness, truth is from lie. You can't take truth and mix it with a lie and end up with truth. Huh? Yeah, you can't. It always ends up lying. Try to. Take, 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 take 99.999% truth and mix it with 0.0001% lie. What do you got? Lie. lie. It's just harder to detect, detect isn't it? Hmm. As the limit of X approaches zero, right? And it gets that bad. It gets that, that level of dilution. And you can't detect it. You can't discern it. Father, Jesus Christ came to us. He's the truth, the life, the way. He came, opened up the door for you and I to step into something that is measurable. Somebody said, oh, faith, it's like politics. No, it isn't. Oh, faith, it's blind. You can't see it. No, it isn't. It's living. <laughs> it's measurable. It's reproducible. It's qualitative and quantitative. I'm going to minister what I was going to minister to you later tonight. Later today. I know you opened up your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, and I didn't get to that. I just laid foundation. Because God is pleading. This is what I heard of the Spirit this morning. Look at him. Look at him. See him now. Look at him now. He's high and lifted up. Look at him now. See him in the beauty of his love. Look at him now as he's pleading for the people. Father's pleading for you. Right now, you get to say, Lord, have your own way. Lord, I surrender my will, but there will come a time where Father will have it only his way. How do you like that? It's his way or the highway. Or the low way, rather. How do you like that? I'm saying, oh, God, come rule over me. You rule. Come rule sovereignly. 
Come rule with a rod of iron. Come rule with correction and authority. Oh, Lord, I don't want to make one move outside of what you choose. You, you see the end from the beginning. You know the end from the beginning. You know every, you know every, every solution to every problem. You know every, every end to every decision. Come rule. He's full of loving kindness and tender mercies. I'll take, a, I'll take that person and rule over me. Huh? He's full of truth and equity. He doesn't pervert judgment. He's the ruler who's de extremely devoted to your blessing. To you being blessed and taken well care of and provided for. What ruler is there like unto him? That has ever been described in the history books of men. In the poetry and the stories and the songs of men. None. There's none. Such an idea doesn't exist. For men must be able to create something that reflects their own experience. And such, a, such a, an event has never taken place outside of interacting with the living God. The Father wants to prove himself to you. You may say to somebody, well, prove it to me. Why don't you talk to him? Why don't you say, Lord, prove yourself to me. He don't have to. He's so merciful and so loving, kind, full of loving kindness. If he sees truth in your heart, he will. He's pulling on you right now. He's proving himself to you right now. We don't want to convince you with words of men's wisdom, but I'm not using words of men's wisdom. I'm using words of God's wisdom. Hallelujah. I'm using what the things that God said in his word, which lives and abides forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Choose this day whom you will serve. Decide whose side you're on. It's time you make a it's time to make an intelligent decision. Huh? About who's going to rule over you. It has a consequence. It's not like Electing a senator or a congressman. I believe about the only choice we have there is to try to make a statement through party. I don't think you can make a statement through individuality. Through an individual. You make a statement only through party. And that's normally not much of a statement. Because it is pretty much smoke and mirrors. But praise God, there's still the similitude of what? freedoms and liberty there are that do exist albeit they are being eroded every day and it's always been confined you're not free to walk out this door and walk out go somewhere and find yourself a place to live go pick you out a spot of land say that's mine you know what I'm saying I don't want to go through all the list of that. I just, I just hope that you can recognize you're not as free as you think you are. I'm just been, I've been liberated to not be my own person. I've been liberated to serve God. That's what freedom is to me. The privilege to now live wholly under the rule of God. To live Holy under the rule of the spirit of truth. To no longer be deceived and lied to and tricked into choices. Every sin is a deception and a lie to you. It's a trick into a choice. In Jesus' name, I set you free. In Jesus' name, everybody in this place who wants to be liberated... I come to you with a proclamation, declaration of the gospel. You no longer need to live under the bondage of sin and torment. I think of today, I just thinking, because I see something, some going, some things going on here this morning. And I, would, I just remember the day when a person who came into the ministry and very bright person. 
played the piano very well, gave his life to Jesus. Beautiful things happening in his life. Then he decided with a couple of other folks that I was not the guy to listen to, that I was hard, too radical. And he ended up getting involved in drugs, got addicted to methamphetamines, crystal meth, destroyed his mind, completely destroyed his mind. Couldn't hold a thought, couldn't think. All that he was and all that he had, basically, from a natural gifting, was gone. You know, this is a story of many people. Just going to have a little fun. Nobody has fun like that. Nobody has fun taking a gun and going, with one bullet in the chamber, seeing if you can drill a hole in your head. That's crazy. It's insane. It's the same thing that goes on with drugs. Oh, we're having fun. No, you're not having fun. You're destroying your soul. You're destroying your soul, man. You're ruining the gift of life that God gave you. It's a lie. It's the biggest lie that it's the biggest lie that's ever been told. To believe that you can that through drugs and alcohol, you're going to have fun. Go talk to any any drunk on Skid Row, any person living out there in the di- in the, the gully in his own urine and vomit. Ask him how it began. Oh, they're just having fun. Oh, I started drinking in junior high school. Going out partying. There you go. Wait as soon as death. Look at the folks with sexually transmitted diseases. They're having fun. Every abortion, two people die. And then how many, and then what goes on in this nation? So filled with innocent blood. It's deep in it. It's just time that everybody in this place chooses come under the rule. If you come under the rule of God, you come under His sovereign rule, then you will have the opportunity to learn to walk in His ways, to learn to honor Him and obey Him. If you don't, if you just make it something where it's just fuzzy, where you're still living in the world while you're trying to live for God, or you just got religion. Reli- just having religion means that nothing really about your life changes. Not really. You still have the same lust of the flesh, same lust of the eye, same pride of life, same desire as everybody else. Huh? In Jesus' name. God's pleading with you. He's high and lifted up, but he's pleading with you. He's pleading with the people. His train fills the temple. But yet he still is so, he's so concerned over even the vilest person. The vilest person. He still just, he pleads. The, mo- the person who's done the worst wickedness against him, he still loves them so desperately. I can't even imagine. It's too far from me. It's too beyond my ability to comprehend or understand It's unimaginable. This is who he is. This is who he has described himself to be. This is what he's done. This is that which set me free. This is what changed my life and the lives of millions of others in the same way. I've watched watched people up in the 88th parallel in the Arctic respond the same way to the presence of the Lord as people out in the Pitanjara's wilderness, backwoods of the outback of Australia. They never had, they, they, they're not culturally related. They're not, they are not impacted or influenced. Margaret Mead. By each other, completely isolated groups. Spawn the same way to the anointing.
Father's pleading with you. He's pleading. Don't sell your soul for things that cannot profit. Mm. Come under his rule. Come under his rule. It's time. God's calling. He'll teach you how to walk in the wisdom of the Spirit. People may not understand, but they might rather just walk in their own mind and understanding. But God did you walk under the rule of the Spirit. Ha! Hoda Satai, I must die. He'd teach you to make choices that are blessed. Hallelujah. Kuda Manda say. You can't get around people and then not get blessed. Because the blessing of God is on you. Hallelujah. Everywhere you go, you become a blessing instead of a curse. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can become a giver instead of a taker. <laughs> you walk into a house and someone's sick. There's nothing so wonderful as saying, who's sick in the house? Oh, yeah. Baby's been sick now for two weeks. We're not, doctor's not sure. Well, here, in Jesus' name, be made whole. In Jesus' name, be healed. And baby gets up, starts running around. The whole house is filled with happiness. Say, no, mine. And the Lord does it for free. Just does it for free. He doesn't say, now I gave you something. Now you got to give me something. He doesn't do that. He already gave you more than you can possibly ever ask for. You're breathing in and out. It's his breath. He breathed into man the breath of life. Into his nostrils the breath of life. You're breathing in and out because of him. My heart's broken for some of you here this morning. I've been pleading with you on behalf of the Father. It's time for you to respond. It's time for you to come out of your ways. Come under the rule. Sovereign, absolute, strict rule of Almighty God. It's time for you to come under the rule. Jesus stands at the door of your heart knocking, banging. He says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door to his heart, I will come in. That's measurable. <laughs> I will come in and I will fellowship with you. I will live with you. That's measurable. That is no touchy-feely religious thing. That's a powerful God thing. That's like creating a galaxy thing, you know. That's big. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to break off the strongholds of every mind-blinding spirit, every lying force of hell. In Jesus' name, I bind you, Satan. I destroy your work of deception upon the lives of those who are sitting here in this place. That every man in a right mind, in a sound mind, will make their choice, their eternal choice of who they're going to serve. Themselves or God. And of course we know that no man really serves himself. It's just the, the notion. But I want to just kind of Make it easier for you to com comprehend here for just a minute by the Spirit of the Lord. Somebody said, my sin doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah, it does. Hurts God. Hurts you. Hurts those who love you. Hurts those who have a relationship with you. Rebellion. Rebellion in a house. A woman constantly criticizing her husband is a destructive force. Constantly won't trust. Always suspicious. It's a destructive force. It ruins the houses of a vast majority of the population. Just that very thing. Just that very thing. An unholy rule and governorship over people's hearts and minds. It's time to get free. It's time to get free. It's time to quit justifying yourself when the fruit of your life.
proves to you. God's so gracious, so merciful. Doesn't rub it too much, doesn't really rub it in anybody's face as it were. He lets everybody to see. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see? All that, all that is around you is showing you. Father wants to change everything. He wants you to come under his rule. You come under his rule, everything, everything and everybody around you is going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed. That's what Father wants to do. He's devoted to loving you. I'm going to say it one more time. He's devoted to loving you. He's devoted to blessing you. He's devoted to keeping you. He's your provider, your protector, your perfecter. Come on. Here's the beautiful thing for all of you. I'm going to close with this. The Lord says if you want to learn, if you're willing to walk with me, if you're willing to be taught by me, He says, I'll forgive you 490 times in a day. I won't run out of forgiveness. I won't run out of mercy. I forgive you. I forgive you. As long as you want to learn, as long as you want to get it right. When all of a sudden, it's not about getting it right. It's not about doing right. It's about being right. Then it's done. It's over. You're not going to receive anything from the Lord. Because all you want to do is be justified in your own thinking. Continue on the same way. You're just stubborn doing it your own way. You just want to do it this way. You feel this is good. And after all, you have the right to make it a choice. It's a free, it's a free society. It's living in a free country. No, you don't. Just, just more free than other countries. Yeah. Praise God for that. Praise God for the freedom. The little bit of freedom that you do see in certain cultures and societies. But what the Lord is asking you is He says, I'll liberate you. I'll set you free. You know the truth and you'll live in freedom. The truth to make you free. Everybody, would you stand with me? Well, I figure I've already had the altar call. The decision making has been going on. But I do want to say this. If you want us to pray with you and for you, for your soul. That's exactly why we're here. We'll pray with you and for you over the state of your soul, your life, your spiritual existence now. It exists now and will not cease to exist. Don't say in the future, later. No, today's the day. I do respect people saying, you know what, I'm just not ready to give up these things. I'm not really ready to change. I don't want to change yet. Well, the reality of it is, is that you just come. Yeah, that's good. Just come. Anybody, just come. I want you to just come. So you may say, I'm not really ready to change. Well, you can live under that deception because that deception will make you believe that you're not ready to change. But you have an encounter with God. And there will be, be an event of change. You'll have a different heart and a different mind about it than you have right now. So anybody wants us to pray with your soul, why don't you just come? You want us to pray with your soul, with you. You want to make a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you've made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus. But you've never found the strength and the ability to, to walk with him. You find yourself continually living in that which God has condemned. And you don't want to live that way. We're here to pray for you, to see God strengthen you. So you can find power and divine ability. To no longer live being ruined, continually ruined by the powers of darkness. I want you to come. I want you to come. Good. Just come stand right here, my dear bro. Just you just you stay right, you stay there. You come up here if you want. I don't care. 
You know what? I like folks when folks don't know what to do. You know why? Because that means then I've been doing it over and again. Sikambrava sapatalia satavadaya. 